good afternoon. And welcome to this sesquicentennial celebration of the establishment of a United States Navy installation in Connecticut. Today's ceremony has been 150 years in the making, and in that time, the Connecticut Navy installation has become Naval Submarine Base New London, our Navy's first and finest submarine base. April 11 also marks the birthday of the United States Navy's Submarine Force, the most professional and capable undersea force in the world. This afternoon, there will be some speeches, some proclamations, and some bell ringing. We will ceremonially ring out another year of steadfast service to the nation by our Navy base in Connecticut and Submarine Force, and we'll ring in the start of another year on watch by sub base our navies and Sentinels of the Deep. As we proceed, I ask military members in uniform in our audience to remain covered and follow my visual cue for saluting. Without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the presentation of the colors and the playing of the national anthem. Color Guard, parade the colors. Ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem. Tire the colors.
your party. Ready? Two. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in showing our appreciation to the Naval Submarine School Silver Dolphins Color Guard. Thank you. Please be seated. Mayor Passero, Mr. Ross, Admiral Pitts, Captain White Scarver, mayors, selectmen, elected officials, community leaders, and neighbors in our southeastern Connecticut and Navy New London community, major commanders, commanding officers, and all members, veterans, and friends of our submarine force, our Navy, and of the vast industrial cadre that make our submarine force and the Navy the finest in the history of the world. Men and women of Naval Submarine Base New London, Naval Submarine School, and Navy Team New London. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Groton, Connecticut, the submarine capital of the world, and Naval Submarine Base New London, the home of the submarine force. I am Lieutenant Commander Brad Boyd, officer in charge of Historic Ship Nautilus and director of the Submarine Force Museum. As a steward of our submarine forces history, I'm pleased to be serving as Master of Ceremonies today. And I am delighted you could join us as we celebrate the sesquicentennial of the establishment of U.S. Navy installation in Connecticut and the birthday of the finest submarine force in the world. Visitors to southeastern Connecticut are often confused by Naval Submarine Base New London's name and location. Quite a few of you, as locals, might even joke that the installation's name and location are truly a testament to the stealth of the submarine force. Visitors to New London are thoroughly confused when they cannot find the base in the city because it's really located in the communities of Groton and Ledger on the opposite side of the river. I'm sure we'll learn a little more about the, that naming convention during the celebration. Today, Submarine Base New London is home to 15 fast attack submarines and more than 70 tenant commands. Together we form Navy Team New London. And the sub base's members of that team are all committed to positively impacting the fleet fighters, and families stationed here through the best infrastructure and service support we can deliver. Certainly two key elements of that service support are helping our submarines get to sea and bringing them home again safely, and ensuring the professional training of the cadre of submariners who take those warships to sea. That's been the more than 100-year dual mission of Naval Submarine Base in London. And now it's my pleasure to call upon the base's 51st commanding officer to offer some brief remarks and make the next introduction. Please join me in welcoming Captain Paul A. Whitescarver. I feel lucky that I'm first because it is a little chilly up here. So, uh, you know, what a great Navy day. Mayor Passero and mayors, selectmen, state and local officials and community leaders, you know, thanks so much for coming out today. You represent a southeastern Connecticut community that is open, embracing, and supportive of our, our Navy family here in New London, Connecticut. Bob, thank you for representing the governor of the state today. Welcome back to your Connecticut Navy base and our nation's first and finest submarine base. Staff and members representing our Connecticut congressional delegation, thank you for joining us and for all that you do to support the senators and congressmen who have such a great passion, interest, and desire to advance the home of the submarine force. Superintendent staff and students from our local schools and student leadership programs like Junior ROTC and the Sea Cadets, you are shaping our next 150 years, and those years look bright indeed. You all exemplify the definition of good neighbors. And as someone who lives on the base next to Admiral Pitts, I can attest, good neighbors make all the difference. Thanks, Admiral. Admiral Pitts, thank you, sir, for taking the time and your busy schedule to be with us today. Members and friends of the United States Coast Guard, I see one of you out there. Uh, with the United States Marine Corps, help our Navy form the world's premier maritime team. Thank you for joining us. Major commanders and leadership from the waterfront, upper base, the Submarine Learning Center, Naval Submarine School. This base and our teams are here because of the submarines and sailors who call Subbase home. Thank you for being here. Members, veterans, and friends of the submarine base, New London and our remarkable submarine force, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for joining us as we celebrate 150 years of a Navy installation in Connecticut and 118 years 
of the United States Submarine Force. I want to personally thank Lieutenant Commander Brad Boyd, our Master of Ceremonies, for all he and his team at this historic ship and museum do every day to promote and preserve our submarine force and sub-base history. Well done, Nautilus. And on this milestone day for this installation's brick and mortar and our force's history, we really exist because of people. That's right, our people. Sailors, civilians, and family members who serve, sacrifice, and shoulder duties and responsibilities in support of all Americans, while supporting comprising less than 1% of our nation's population. They have my admiration every day. Please join me in a round of applause for all the sailors, civilians, and family members here today at Team New London. I also want to uh, follow an extraordinary legacy of boldness and courage, a legacy and fashion enforced by the commitment of our veterans that are here today. Selfless service and sacrifice, a legacy passed on by us, by our submarine veterans. Please join me in a round of applause to salute the submarine veterans and many of them who support the notions of population here in the museum. greatest submarines in the world, and those of us like me who have taken the sea and into harm's way cannot be more pleased with the product we get to use. Please join me in a round of applause for Electric Boat. <laughs> Connecticut and its citizens embraced our Navy installation and sailors 150 years ago, just as they continue to do so today. And just like that initial gift of land for the establishment of a naval installation here, Connecticut and its citizens have continued to correct the investment facts. In fact, since 2009, the state of Connecticut, in cooperation with the Navy and complementing much larger federal investments, has already funded approximately $14 million in some base infrastructure improvements. From the state of the art Navy diver support facility, or dive lockers, we call it. And a building addition to the base's Nimitz Hall to house a high-tech submarine bridge simulator training facility to train officers and crews in submarine navigation, to modernizing a boiler at the base's power plant and constructing a culinary training center at the base galley, consisting of a full-scale, fully functional replica of a galley found on Virginia-class submarines. The state of Connecticut and its citizens have been extremely generous. Most recently, the Navy accepted Connecticut's offer to fund two additional projects in Subbase that we are working hard to bring to fruition. The first project provides security enhancement and encroachment mitigation as Subbase's boundaries, where a commercial railroad bisects the base. And the second project is a little more ambitious. It involves engineering and design support for the future construction of a microgrid on the base. We marked a recent step toward this microgrid goal this past October when the Navy, CMEC, and Fuel Cell Energy of Danbury agreed on details of signing a fuel cell park on the base. Such investments is humbling and helps assure this installation's vitality and viability in the years ahead. Of course, 150 years ago when Connecticut and the city of New London invested in the establishment of the U.S. Navy installation here, we couldn't have foreseen where would we where we would be today. As I said earlier, it's because of people. Generous and welcoming people like those of southeastern Connecticut. New London Mayor Mike Passero exemplifies these terrific neighbors. In 2016, with then town of Groton Mayor Bruce Flax, City of Groton Mayor Mary Galbraith, and Ledger Mayor Mike Finkelstein. Mayor Passero helped spearhead the year-long Connecticut Submarine Century celebration. An avid sailor himself and an enthusiastic and an enthusiast of Connecticut's and New London's uh, maritime history and legacy, as well as our Navy and Coast Guard's ties to it, Mayor Passero has been a steadfast supporter of the Connecticut Maritime Heritage Festival. And as he leads the city of New London, the city for which this installation and base have been named, his commitment to public service, making a difference, and helping impact the future, just like the base, is always evident. So ladies and gentlemen, 
please join me in welcoming the mayor of the city of New London, the Honorable Mike Passer. Thank you for that warm introduction, Captain. Admiral Pitts, Captain White Scarver, Bob Ross. Bob is the smarty pants that wore an overcoat. Other distinguished guests, it is truly an honor for me to represent the city of New London at this event to commemorate this milestone in the history of submarine base New London. My father, Chief Warrant Officer Ernest Passero, would be very proud were he alive today. Let me first express my gratitude to those who serve and all the veterans here today. My life eventually led me to public service, but it did not lead me to follow in my father's footsteps with military service. While I did not serve, I am very proud, excuse me, <clears throat> while I did not serve, I am very proud to be a product of this region's military tradition, especially the tradition and the culture of the submarine base. I probably stand as a fair example of the many people in this immediate region and in my city. There are many throughout the nation that have at least one connection with New London because of the submarine base. And that is, they were born at l &M Hospital. They followed their destiny, carrying with them a birth certificate from New London, Connecticut, and their everlasting connection to submarine base New London. I share my destiny with the many people who call this place home, having built my life here because of the Navy and this base. For 150 years, the base has encouraged migration to the region and significantly directed our development and economic growth. If this blows away, we're gonna end this quickly. Let me share a little of my story as one of those naval migrants to New London. I'm a child, I'm child number three of seven. My older sister was born while my father was stationed in Georgia. I was born at St. Albans Hospital on the naval base in Queens, New York. My next youngest sister had the distinction of carrying dual French and U.S. citizenship until she was 21 because she was born in a French civilian hospital in Nice. How that happened is a story for another day. But Navy spouses today would probably be jealous because in 1958, my mom and me and my two sisters were living in a chateau overlooking the Riviera while my father was stationed on a destroyer in the Mediterranean. I have no memory of any of that besides the photos, which included one that showed a yacht within view from our villa that my parents would tell us belonged to Aristotle Onassis. They had a good life in the Navy. But my memory begins in New London, my dad's last duty assignment. He was stationed aboard USS Fulton, a sub-tender moored south in the river here at State Pier, always with three or four subs tied alongside. For some reason, I have one clear memory from that time of eating vanilla ice cream in the mess aboard one of those submarines. Like many other families, the Pastoral family established roots in New London because of this base. With 20 years of service, my dad decided to retire and raise his family in New London. He moved from tending subs to building subs, and the sub base was a focal point of our family life. Every Saturday included the trip to the commissary and the exchange, haircuts, dentists, youth sports, entertainment, you name it, the sub base provided it. My youth included character building experiences like watching Dr. Shivago on wooden seats in the theater at Daly Center. If you remember Dr. Shivago, it was very long. It was like a four hour movie. It didn't seem to matter how serious our childhood injuries were, 
but we would be loaded into a 1963 Ford station wagon and zipped over to the sub-hospital to be treated by a corpsman. The loss of the thresher, whose anniversary was yesterday, is one very sad memory from my childhood and a reminder of the bond shared by Navy families in the region. One of the proudest moments that we share as a region in southeastern Connecticut was on October 24, 2005, when submarine base New London was removed from the BRAC closure list. That fight was truly a fight to preserve our region, our self-image, and our history, and our heritage. Examples of my city's partnership with this base are too numerous to recount here, but they include most proudly and most recently our collaboration during the sum, summer of 2015 on New London's celebration of the Coast Guard Academy's, uh, the Coast Guard's anniversary, 125th anniversary, and during the year-long regional celebration of sub-century, and I'd like to give a shout out to my partner in that, uh, former Mayor of Groton, Marion Glauberth, who joins us here today. Thank you, Marion. Would you give a wave, please? Thank you. I'll close where I opened, expressing my pride for this space, for all of you who serve and have served, and for the history we have yet to make together. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Now it's my honor to be able to introduce another great friend of our Navy and of, the Canadian, of our Connecticut submarine base. On behalf of the governor and all Connecticut citizens, he has been a dedicated supporter of all our military in Connecticut. His focus on sub base and his ongoing transformation never wavers, and he continues to boldly steward wise investment in sub base's future. But more than that, in his visits to sub base and his regular dialogue with the Navy and base leadership, it's clear that he keeps the fleet, fighters, and families stationed here always in his mind and heart. Please join me in welcoming the Executive Director of the State of Connecticut's Office of Military Affairs, Mr. Bob Ross. <laughs> you know, I don't know why Chris Sennett likes to do this to people. This is the second time in a year he's had us out here in the cold to do a ceremony like this. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's great to be here. Governor Malloy is unable to be here. Many of you know how much he loves this place. He loves to come down here and just kind of soak up the history of the Submarine Force Museum. But the legislature's in session and they're dealing with some pretty tough issues up there in Hartford and he couldn't be here today. He asked me to express his disappointment and I brought with me a statement from the governor with his official seal that expresses the state of Connecticut's uh, appreciation and honor to host the submarine base. So other speakers today are going to talk more about the last 150 years. But I'm going to talk about today and tomorrow. 2005 BRAC, can you imagine what a catastrophic strategic mistake it would have been for our nation to close this base? In my previous career, I was a spokesman at the Pentagon on national level issues, including the submarine force. And it was part of my job to articulate why this base should be closed. So I know personally how those decisions and recommendations are made within the bureaucratic halls of the Pentagon. The mission of the Navy is to fight and win our nation's wars at sea and ashore. It is not the mission of the Navy to operate like a business, making decisions solely on the best financial return on investment. Of course, we all want to be good stewards of tax dollars, but that's secondary to defending this country. We must place our forces where they are in the best strategic position to defend America, not where they save us the most money. This base has strategic value as it relates to force structure changes that we are seeing in the fleet today. The role of the submarine has changed. Today's Navy has profound implications in strategic basing 
because of the way the submarine forces change. When I served in the Navy, the aircraft carrier and its battle group was the centerpiece of the fleet. Now make no mistake about it, the battle group is still a massive concentration of influence and power projection, but today the Navy is using the agility of stealthy and powerful submarines to project power as they never have before. We are seeing a resurgence of submarines from Russia and China and other places as we seek to maintain our dominance of the undersea domain. We're realizing a great increase in submarine construction right here on the Thames River. As we replace the Los Angeles class with the more advanced Virginia class, production is going to steadily increase over the next several de decades. The synergy shared by this operational base and electric boat has real value and it was recognized by the BRAC Commission in 2005 when they took the base off the list. As the number of submarines in the fleet grows, the Navy will need every certified peer space they have to support strategic homeporting requirements. In the years since 2005 BRAC, Connecticut emerged as a national leader, providing a model in how you support a Navy base. I like to describe it as investments and partnerships. Connecticut was the first state in recent history to provide direct funding for on-base infrastructure to enhance military value. Our state legislature set aside $40 million for specially selected projects. Over the last 10 years, we've funded energy and utility projects, enhanced education and training facilities, purchased abutting land for encroachment mitigation, all designed to enhance the military value of this base and demonstrate Connecticut's commitment. And you experienced some of that when you got here today, when you drove down Crystal Lake Road, and you saw how the state is helping rebuild the access to the base, improving security and safety. Other examples of partnerships outside the base include the Southeastern Connecticut Council of Governments, where the base commanding officer has a seat at the table and he helps shape regional policy, just like any other mayor or first selectman. The military superintendent's liaison committee was established to create a regular forum to address challenges and opportunities for family members in our public schools. It's a highly successful partnership that led to the national level compact on education for military children. These partnerships and others culminated in the submarine century we celebrated last year, and we were given the great distinction as one of America's great defense communities. As we look out on this great river, we should all appreciate the centuries of history it holds. I'm reading a great book right now on the War of 1812, and it's just amazing how many monumental events took place here on the Thames, on both shores, in every military campaign since the American Revolution. Over the years, the ports of Boston, Newport, and New York City have lost their role in the operational Navy. Today, submarine base New London is the only Navy base in all of New England that still deploys operational forces to the fleet. Should this base close, all of New England would be left out of the operational Navy. That would be a tragedy for our nation and a betrayal of the great traditions of New England that gave life to the United States and the Navy almost 250 years ago. Today, we, the state of Connecticut and its municipalities, reaffirm our enduring relationship with sailors and Marines, their families, and this historic base, the last Navy base in all of New England to deploy operational forces in every ocean and deep sea on Earth. And we are determined to do all we can to ensure the strategic distinction will endure for another 150 years. Thank you for being here today supporting those who serve at sea and ashore defending America, and for contributing to the greatest Navy human history has ever seen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ross. As we've heard, Subbase's origin is traced to the foresight, hard work, and determination of Connecticut leaders and citizens. 
Members of Connecticut's congressional delegation certainly played a key part. Following in those footsteps are Connecticut's senior U.S. Senator Richard Blumenthal, Connecticut's junior U.S. Senator, Senator Chris Murphy, and U.S. Congressman Joe Courtney, who has represented the 2nd Congressional District of Connecticut in the House of Representatives since 2006. While the Senators and Congressmen could not join us today due to pressing matters in Washington, members of the hardworking and supportive staffs are here, and they bring a resolution submitted on the floor of the Senate by Senators Blumenthal and Murphy, and a similar statement from the floor of the House of Representative, Representatives submitted by Congressman Courtney. It's my honor to read the Senate resolution now. In the Senate of the United States, a resolution designating April 11, 2018 as the sesquicentennial of Connecticut's Navy installation, whereas the Navy installation of Connecticut, regarded as Naval Submarine Base New London, had its beginning as a Naval Yard and Storage Depot on April 11, 1868. Whereas the people of Connecticut made the installation possible when a deed of gift from the state of Connecticut and city of New London was signed, conveyed, and presented to the Secretary of Navy, Gideon Wells. Whereas the Navy installation in Connecticut was first used for laying up inactive ships, then for refueling small naval ships traveling through the waters of New England, and ultimately as the first submarine base of the United States Navy. Whereas October 18, 1915, marked the arrival at the Navy installation of Connecticut of the submarines G-1, G-2, and G-4 under the care of the tender USS Ozark, soon followed by the arrival of submarines E-1, D-1, and D-3 under the care of tender USS Tanava. And on November 1, 1915, the arrival of the first ship built as a submarine tender, the USS Fulton. Whereas on June 21, 1916, Commander Yates Sterling Jr. assumed command of the newly designated Naval Submarine Base New London, the New London Submarine Flotilla, and the Submarine School. Whereas the property of Naval Submarine Base New London expanded during the course of the involvement of the United States in World War I, with Congress approving more than $1 million for real estate and facilities expansion, which created 81 buildings to support 1,400 men and 20 submarines by the end of World War I. Whereas the second largest expansion of naval submarine base in London occurred during World War II, when the submarine force exponentially grew in size and the installation enlarged from 112 acres to 497 acres to accommodate the thousands of personnel that serviced the growing fleet. Whereas the nuclear power age following World War II ushered technological advancements in submarine development with the advent of nuclear-powered submarines and the arrival of USS Nautilus, the first nuclear-powered vessel in the world, when it was commissioned in 1954 at Naval Submarine Base, New London. Whereas the USS George Washington, the first nuclear ballistic submarine in the United States Navy, created further changes at Naval Submarine Base, New London, when it was commissioned there in 1959. Whereas in 2018, Naval Submarine Base, New London, extends along the east side of the Thames River, occupies approximately 687 acres, and houses more than 160 major facilities and more than 15 nuclear submarines. Whereas Naval Submarine Base New London supports fleet readiness by providing quality service and facilities to its fleet, fighters, and families. Whereas the mission of Naval Submarine Base New London is to home port and put submarines to sea and to support the Submarine Center of Excellence, which trains submariners to take submarines to sea. Whereas nearly every submariner in the United States Navy will be stationed at Naval Submarine Base New London for training, with a potential tour of duty in one of the attack submarines home ported in installation or the pre commissioning unit for a new submarine under construction in General Dynamics Electric Boat Shipyard in Groton, Connecticut. Whereas Naval Submarine Base New London is home to more than 70 tenant commands and activities, including the Undersea Warfighting Development Center, the Submarine Learning Center, the Naval Submarine School, the Naval Submarine Medical Research Laboratory, and the Naval Undersea Medical Institute. Whereas Naval Submarine Base New London is one of the largest employers in southeastern Connecticut and employs more than 9,500 active duty, reserve, and civilian personnel, and whereas Naval Submarine Base New London will always be regarded as the first and finest submarine base in the United States Navy and the home of the submarine force. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Senate designates April 11, 2018, as the sesquicentennial of Connecticut's Navy installation commends the long-standing dedication and contribution to the Navy by the people of Connecticut, both through the initial deed of gift that established the Navy installation of Connecticut, and through their ongoing commitment to support the mission and people assigned to the installation, presently known as Naval Submarine Base in London. 
honors the sailors and submariners who have trained and served at the Navy installation in Connecticut throughout its 150-year history in support of the naval and undersea superiority of the United States. Recognizes the indispensable role naval submarine based in London plays in fortifying the national security of the United States at a time when adversaries seek to challenge the United States. And pledges continued support for the operation of naval submarine based New London for years to come. With that wonderful honor and with a nod to Navy tradition, let us ring out the completion of 150 years of steadfast and dedicated service by Connecticut's Navy installation and 118 years of bold and courageous service by United States Submarine Force. Quartermaster, sound the traditional eight bells. Use the signal the end of the watch. As you have already heard today, the date April 11th also marks the key anniversary in the identity and heritage of the United States Submarine Force. Today, the future of undersea warfare is being developed right here in our community. Our next speaker coordinates the training, assessment, tactical development, and analysis of all undersea warfighting capabilities for the Navy and is the flag officer that calls Subbase home with his headquarters, Rear Admiral Pitts. We are honored that he could participate in today's celebration. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the commander of the Undersea Naval Development Center, correct, Undersea Warfighting Development Center, Rear Admiral Jimmy Pitts. Thank you for that kind of in introduction, Brad. See, it's so cold I can't even uh, get, to get my words out. Just three weeks ago, I was up in the Arctic Ocean at ice camp during ISEX, and uh, frankly, I'm colder right now than I was then. Ah. Yeah, yeah, Mayor Ball gave me his coat. Uh, Mayor Pizarro, Mr. Ross, uh, my neighbor, Paul Whitescarver, distinguished guests, and friends of the submarine base New London, it's great to join you all for this wonderful event to celebrate a double anniversary. 150 years of New London submarine base and 118 years of the submarine force. 150 years ago, the state needed over 112 acres for naval purposes, later designated as the Navy Yard and again as a coaling station. I doubt anyone back then envisioned it as the cradle of the submarine force that is it is today, particularly since the first submarine was not purchased until 32 years later to the day. The Holland 6, purchased on April 11, 1900, was a 53 foot long, 10 and a quarter foot diameter experimental submarine from John P. Holland at the Holland Torpedo Boat Company. It would later become our nation's first commissioned submarine, USS Holland, and the forerunner of the modern submarine force. Quite a lot has changed, as we've heard through our various speakers and the uh, in the Senate resolution since that April 11, 1900 date. Submarines have become larger, faster, and more capable than anyone could have possibly imagined in 1900. They also cost a little more than that now than that original purchase price of $150,000. I'll let your imagination run on how much a new submarine today costs. Our United States Submarine Force today is the most advanced, the most capable, and the best trained in the world. And a majority of that reason is because it all happens here at Submarine Base in New London, as Brad talked about. Today we consist of 52 attack submarines, 14 ballistic missile submarines, and four guided missile submarines. Spurred by that legacy that Holland started 118 years ago today, our force remains crucial to gathering intelligence, maintaining strategic deterrence, preparing the battle space for joint forces, and projecting power in a world of evolving and unpredictable challenges. We in the submarine force remain keenly aware that our global power projection from these very shores requires more support than we can generate organically. 
the 150-year partnership with the state and local industries are foundational to our success. I consider it a privilege and a pleasure to lead Undersea Warfighting Development Center from my headquarters here at Naval Submarine Base New London, mainly because of the access that it allows to the highest quality facilities in the world for undersea warfare. Of course, your support goes deeper than just infrastructure, supporting the needs of the sailors and the families that call Connecticut home. You treat us and our families like members of your families in communities that may be new to us, may be far from home. It's hard to believe that a kid from Lower Alabama calls Connecticut home. But I do, and I'm proud of it. You're all here today. You represent the true strength behind our Navy and our nation. You who support our submarine force, you who allow in it and encourage your sons and daughters to serve in the submarine force. You who have served in the force before us and you who are currently serving in our submarine force. You fellow Americans are our service members' greatest advocates and champions. And I know I speak for the entire submarine force when I thank you for your stead steadfast support. It has been an honor to speak to all of you. May God bless this state and this community May God bless the United States Navy and the submarine force, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. And now, as Connecticut's Navy installation, Naval Submarine Base New London, begins another 150 years of service to our Navy, our nation, and the great state of Connecticut, and as our United States submarine force begins another year of service as our bold, courageous Sentinels of the Deep, I'll ask Mayor Pasro, Mr. Ross, Admiral Pitts, and Captain Weisscover to proceed to the bell and ring in the start of a new watch. Ladies and gentlemen, as we've rung in the start of this new year of service for Connecticut's Navy installation and our submarine force, we ask for our blessing. Please rise. I would now like to call Lieutenant Guy Passmore, chaplain at the Naval Submarine Support Center on base, to offer a prayer. Chaplain Passmore. Let's pray. Eternal God, on this 150th anniversary of the United States Navy's presence in this area, we celebrate a rich history steeped in courage and patriotism and in love of God and country. During this celebration, we are mindful of those whose sacrificers undergird the freedom we so often take for granted. From the eras of World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm and Shield, to our present era, we are constantly reminded of, our un of your unfailing presence in our lives. Names like Rickover, Flucky, Bledsoe, and countless others remind us also of the legendary ones that paved the way for us. Leaders that taught us to be bold and creative, thus better prepared to lead this great submarine force in an environment of increasing uncertainty and accelerating change. Remind us again, O oh Lord, in our privileged work that the price of freedom is not free, but it demands vigilance, service, commitment, sacrifice, and above all, an awareness that you, O Holy One, are with us. While our sailors' thoughts are often on finding, tracking, and targeting anything that moves below the water and above it, remind us again that your spirit flows wherever you choose. So finding, tracking, and targeting you becomes an impossibility for our hopes, but not for us. Our hope and the world's hope rest in somehow finding you, or perhaps allowing you to find us. And so we humbly pray, help us in our search, so that we are honorable in our dealings with others, that we will have the courage to do what, we, what must be done, and that we stay committed to our obligations and responsibilities. 
Now I pray that you would bless our president, our congressional leaders, our secretary, our community leaders, and our military commanders with your wisdom and your presence. Bless this anniversary celebration as we go from our well-established heroic legacy to our boundless future. This we pray in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Those of you who attend our Navy New London ceremonies may know that a celebration just doesn't seem official without cake. We are now honored that Mayor Passero, Mr. Ross, Admiral Pitts, and Captain Weisgarber will cut the two cakes marking the sesquicentennial of the establishment of a U.S. Navy installation in Connecticut and the birthday of the finest submarine force in the world. Will the audience please rise as the official party departs to our song of Anchors Away. Ladies and gentlemen, as the official party repositions, please feel free to gather around the cake tables at the north end of the pier. Now let's help the process with a short countdown. Three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our ceremony. Thank you for your attendance. Please enjoy a piece of cake and please visit the museum's exhibits. Have a great Navy day.